Tori, did you like the show? I enjoyed the show. I was excited. You know, I told you I was going to the game and I was there. And most of the time, people don't know when you watch on TV, you can't really hear too much. But yeah. I thought they did a phenomenal job. I could hear everything. I love the performance. Love seeing little John. Love seeing her. Uh, love seeing Luda come on out and Alicia Keys as well. It was awesome. Her, Alicia Keys, they crushed it. Everyone's like, it was hurried, it was too fast. I, it was such a party, especially, sometimes it doesn't match up. I had to go watch the TV version of it yesterday, but the outfits, mm. the roller skates, like the whole nine yards of it. And then he got married, he got married. Tori, I was at, <laughs> I was at the after party that they were having at, I don't even think it was at, at Aria, and everyone's waiting for Usher to show up, and like literally, like his assistants, like we need a sheet cake, we need a wedding cake. Like it was nobody knew about <laughs> it. They went and they were waiting for them to arrive, uh, and it was all a little. It was a nice cap on the week. You and I saw each other. We had a lot of fun. Um, you, Fletcher Cox, comes in and he crashes the interview, which was amazing. We've had some time to decompress, right? We were back. We, you got to see your babies, hopefully. Um, what's more stressful, being a fan watching your team in the Super Bowl or playing in the Super Bowl? I think I know that. Oh, 1,000%. Uh, being a fan. Um, because there's <laughs> a, lot, a lot of things that you can't control, right? I think the pressure from being a player, you know, I caught myself and I had to check myself saying some things. It's like, bro, you know it's not that easy. Like, shut up, right? You're being a fan right now. Uh, but, you know, just watching the game, man. From a fan perspective, the highs and the lows, it's different when you you know the guys, you know the 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 mood or the huddle, right? That energy on the sideline. But as a fan, it's like you control nothing. You you have nothing. So uh being a fan is extremely stressful. Uh have you reached out to Jed York? Um, I haven't reached out to him since the game. Um, probably give him some time there, mm -hmm. but uh the way I feel about Jed York and what he's done for the 49ers does not change based on the, the outcome of this game, right? I think the 49ers are still one of the premier organizations in the league, and it wasn't that way uh, when I arrived, or excuse me, when I left San Francisco. And I think Jed was getting crushed at that time. And for him to kind of build it up and hire the right guys and uh, watch them grow, I still think he's done a great job. And San Fran will be back in the same position here soon, and hopefully they get over the hump. I mean, I made the case yesterday, like the optimism here is that they have their quarterback, you and I both know. They have their quarterback. They have him on a very humble, modest situation. Uh, right. And that means that their window is open. They, I know they have to figure out Chase Young. They have to do it. By the way, Chase Young, nothing to sneeze at in this game. Hey, listen, I told y'all, right? Everyone, when I said that Chase Young was going to be a major part of this game, have a great impact, folks from this show killed me <laughs> on Twitter. Absolutely destroyed me. And I was like, it's fine. I know what he's capable of. And he did it. Um, unfortunately, they didn't win. Had they won the game, we would have been talking a lot about Chase Young and the way he influenced that game. But they didn't, and that's a tough part of it. But either way for him, uh, I'm glad to show that he let everyone know who he is when he's locked in and when, he had, when he's at his best, and I'm proud of the way he went out there and played. Yeah, feel free to roll the footage control room there. He's talking about Chase <laughs> Young. I think we have his sack. Feel free. We'll just, I, I, we got nothing but time uh, here on the, the show. Sack, right? do, we have, the... do we have that? Do we have the sack, first sack of the Super Bowl? You know, chases him down in the second quarter. This is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I thought of you the second this happened to her. All right, he had an, uh, drew an intentional grounding call as well. And by the way, they were holding those defensive linemen Ooh. like nobody's business yesterday. Uh, I'm not a conspiracy theory guy by any means. However, the rest for sure let them play right. yesterday. But there were a lot of tackles by the offensive linemen on that field. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Niners side. But, you know, you mentioned being a fan. A fan. I find that's very funny. Because you're just sort of, you know, you're, you're, you, you I could, I could, I just, you, you're so thoughtful that I think you let yourself be a fan, then you call yourself out, and it's like this existential dilemma that you have, which I'm fascinated by. But you let yourself do what a fan would do: is make a bold statement in the scathing take on Twitter. Here's what you said: I think I'm comfortable calling Mahomes the goat. I've seen enough. I'm not being a prisoner of the moment. He is different. I mean, Brady just does have four rings on him. Just saying. He does. And to me, I think rings are a team stat, mm. right? I know that drives some people crazy, but winning is a team stat. And, and the easiest way to point to it, who Tom Brady, who I've called the GOAT for such a long time, right? I always said that Tom Brady's a GOAT, and I think that Aaron Rodgers, but Aaron Rodgers is a better quarterback. That had folks firing me up. <laughs> now I'm comfortable saying that Patrick Mahomes is the best that I've seen. I think what he's able to do with his feet is really what the difference is between him and Brady. I've been on the opposite side of Brady multiple times, right? Scared to death knowing that he has the ball in his hands because he is that great of a quarterback. However, when you're watching the actual play of the position 
Pat's doing things that we haven't seen, right? Just as a player with his arm talent, with this, like he improvises like an artist out there. Just the way he plays plays the game. The only one that's played similar to him is the other guy who I said I think talent wise was better than Brady, and that's Aaron Rodgers. So I think what Pat has been able to done is phenomenal, especially to a start of his career. And I know oftentimes when people talk about goat, they talk the rings, they talk these things. Listen, I can go down each and every quarterback ever, including Mahomes, and show that when they won. It was a team effect there, right? You can go the tuck rule. Maybe Tom Brady doesn't get that. Malcolm Butler doesn't get an interception, right? At the one-yard line, Tom Brady doesn't win another ring, right? But it's a team game, and he did. And that he's one of the best to do it. I love Tom Brady to death, right? And even beyond him as a player, as a person, he did something awesome uh, for my wife's uncle. He had cancer. We were at Preakness one time, and Tom Brady treated this guy that had no business being where we were, right? Like he was the most important person oh, wow. in the world. So I always have a lot of love and respect for him, uh, for who he is as a person, as a player. But Mahomes, I think the way, what he's doing, I'm comfortable saying right now he's the best quarterback to have played this game. Wow, really well said and a, a nice story about Brady in there as well. Uh, incredible. And we just, just celebrate everybody, uh, I think, and what they do and the, the, the greatness as we see it. I, like I was saying to start the show, I'm seeing some of this this fatigue that we saw with the Patriots. Like, I'm sick of them winning. I'm sick of, oh, like, they just won again. But there's something about, like, I just, maybe I just like history. Maybe I like history, and I just, I have such appreciation for how hard it is to win a game, let alone get into the playoffs, let alone, like, win Super Bowl or appear in Super Bowl after Super Bowl. Like, it's, uh, consistency is, I think, the hardest thing to achieve in this craziness that is the NFL. Um, okay, so let's, let's talk. Let, I'm not a sports psychologist. I don't know, but I know with Shanahan, you and I were both saying it, stay aggressive. Don't change it up, stay They're up a touchdown at half. Could they have done more? Man, I think it ultimately boils down to execution and you know, watching the game in person and then going back and doubling on film. I feel like the difference in the game was all their receivers weren't consistently winning one-on-one. -on -one. And you know, I love Debo Samuel. I think he's in, one of the best players in the league. But he was dealing with a little injury there with his hamstring. But ultimately, I think some of the plays that he could have made really would have been a difference in staying on the field, right? I think it's about time you had, and Patrick Mahomes had way too much time. I don't think Shanahan went and folded and was afraid or anything like that. But I feel like in clutch moments when their guys needed to win one-on-one, -on -one, they didn't. And Brock Purdy played a pretty solid game, right? He took care of the ball for the most part. And he had one-on-one -on -one matchups. And I just feel like guys didn't make the plays when they needed them the most. I think you can point to uh, the O-line and the play at the end of the game. But there were things that happened before then when they had the ball with about four minutes left, six minutes left, whatever it was, where it felt like they could have taken mm -hmm. all of the time off of it. And they didn't. And to me, watching it, guys weren't winning their one-on-one -on -one matchup. And so uh, that's just how it goes sometimes, right? I, I, it's tough, you know, to go to the Super Bowl twice as a head coach and lose and uh, go there as a coordinator and not get it done. No one loss looks the same, and I think we've been able to feel that, minus the fact that he's kind of been ahead. But the reality of it is, just watching the game, there's a guy on the other side named Patrick Mahomes where you're like, they're never out of it. Mm -hmm. And I think they didn't take, they left too much time on the clock, which is the same conversation I, re I remember having playing on the opposite side of Brady far too many times where it's like, that's too much time, and they can make something happen. And they did. And also, they, we can't ignore special teams. Hmm. Right. The 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 Chiefs, the Chiefs were gifted a uh, great field position by the ball hitting, you know, a niner in the leg. So that's just the way the ball bounces sometimes. And, uh, you know, they got to get back to the drawing board. I like that you're saying that because it's true. I was looking at the numbers. Christian McCaffrey, the leading receiver, uh, Kittle, Debo, Ayuk combined for eight catches for 86 yards. They just were not winning against man. They just, it just wasn't happening. But when I was watching it, the question I sort of had was, is there more that Kyle could have done with the blitzes? Listen, I, we talked about the week before. Don't blitz Mahomes unless you want the home run shot. That's the way I feel. I'm mm. legitimately afraid of him and what he's <laughs> able to do when guys are scrambling in the all script plays. It feels like when Lamar Jackson's back there. You can blitz him all you want. If you don't get to him, you are going to have problems. And I feel the same way with Mahomes. So I think you can always say in hindsight, hey, we could change it up. But we can't act like this defense didn't do a good enough job to win the game. Right? The defense did a great job. They just weren't a, on, on offense. They didn't. Three's not good enough. Right? Versus Mahomes. You have to score touchdowns if you're going to beat the Chiefs. And the offense just didn't finish enough in the red zone. 
Mm. Um, I was talking more about Spags blitzes. Like, oh, well, could, Spags could, has some stuff now. Spags, that's what I'm saying. Like, could Spags Kyle, was have, in could his Kyle, bag, all right? Could Kyle yes. have done more to help Brock mm. in that? Well, I think, you know what? I feel like they had some options there. Um, again, but Spags had... My favorite blitz was when he had the the DB come inside, like inserted through there. That and was crazy. He didn't he didn't see it right. He he didn't see it coming. The DB backs up, goes on to it's a heck of a play. Um, but Spags was dialing it up all game. You know that's what he's gonna do, right? He's gonna play aggressive. But again, it all comes down to execution. And when they blitz, oftentimes someone's gonna be one on one. Who's gonna win? And do you have enough time? And ult they ultimately it came down to they didn't make enough of those plays that they needed, but. Can I talk about Spags for a moment? Can we, I think he can needs to get a lot more respect for what his role has meant to this team because you're talking about a team earlier this year where you only thought they were going to be contenders towards the middle of the season simply because of Mahomes. Everyone else, the conversations were, oh, they're not the same. The, the dynasty's falling, whatever words you want to use. But that defense was constant. The offense had to catch up, right? And then now you go watch this playoff run, they don't win without the defense playing the way they did. So as much as we're pumping up Mahomes, which we should, right, this defense needs a lot of respect as well with the guys that they had playing up front. And it starts with Coach Bags, uh, excellent coach, uh, great communicator, and again, a very underrated career, if you ask me, as a, as a coach. Um, but I'm happy for him. I was with him in Baltimore mm. uh, for some time, and um, he's one of the best in the business for sure. I was in St. Louis when he was the head coach, and there's a, a lot of reasons that that didn't work out there. But you look at what he's done with the Chiefs, massive turning point for this team when Andy brought him in. They've been a top 10 scoring defense four out of five years there. When, when they brought in Patrick, they were bottom of the barrel. They were not stopping anybody uh, as a defense. They certainly never helped Alex Smith in his long tenure there when he still had success uh, trying to keep them afloat in the, in the West. So I, I love that you're saying that. I made the point earlier that he belongs in the Hall of Fame. Mm. Ch ch hey, that's, that's, four champions. No, mm -hmm. no assistant coach is in the Hall of Fame. But if there was a legacy, a resume that belongs in it, I could see it being Spags. Yeah, I mean, you talk about four different Super Bowls as a coordinator. I mean, there are head coaches that didn't win that many, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, for him being a, a major piece of that, I think you have a great argument to make there. You know, when you talk about greatness and what it means, I think he's consistently shown that. And, again, you can only really dominate where you are he hasn't had the opportunity to be a head coach again since he left mm -hmm. the rams but the reality of it is is he's performed everywhere that he's been so to be a part of now what you can call that they have uh, three of them like one of the best dynasties and also taking care of business in new york that one time mm -hmm. you have to mention him as, as one of the best coordinators of all time and a great argument to get in the hall again when they're head coaches who haven't accomplished what he's accomplished in terms of mm -hmm. winning championships. So I love that thought. Romeo Cornell, Charlie Weiss, Josh McDaniels, they have three apiece as coordinators. To get that fourth one, and especially in the fashion where this defense like carried them all the way, it's something that I think Canton should take seriously uh, and consider. You and I agree on that. We don't, we don't agree on taking the ball first in overtime. <laughs> Sell me on this. Why did you like Kyle's call here? Explain. <laughs> Listen, folks were, it's easy to say, hey, we want to be on defense first. Mm. Y'all, the Chiefs, if I was, I'm going by real time looking at the sideline. They were gassed. The 49ers were gassed after that drive. So to me, more than just the strategic aspect of it, right, they had just lost all momentum with the Chiefs driving down the field, you know, with around two minutes or so left in the game. Those boys were tired. That pass rush was tired. So to me, I didn't think it was a bad decision, especially knowing with the overtime rules now, you both get a shot, right? So I, you don't want a tired defense out there with Mahomes and what they were doing. At that point, he was improvising, making plays with his feet. The ball was going downfield a little bit more, right, as they walk, as they, as they march down the field. To me, I don't think that was his reason for it, but I understood it when I saw it in real time, um, even though nine times out of ten you want to go on defense first to see what you have to do on offense, right? But the reality of it is, is he would have put a tired defense out there. I'm not sure what the results would have been. But don't you want the last, <laughs> don't you want the last chance, Tori? I mean, I think you do, but in, in my opinion, I'm not going for two. 
right? So if you get the field goal and you can mm. seal that at the end of the game, it's fine. Right, but to me, if the defense just goes out and does their job, why aren't that's you going? For, why aren't you going for two? I'm going for two, and I'm not letting you know Pat Mahomes touch it again. Oh, man, going for two is a, is a scary thought. You know, I'm aggressive as they get. Yeah, but going for two to me is is uh, is a scary sight. I'd rather take it into a second overtime than to wow. you know to go out to go out there and, and risk losing it on a two point conversion, but. Uh, you live by, you die by. <laughs> I'm saying all of that as I talk about the Lions a few weeks ago. Yeah, go for it again. Now I'm like, it's super. No. Uh, the way, like, know. if we were on Fear Factor back from back in the day, and it was, am I scared of going for two? Yes. Like, I'm sc- I don't want to walk the rope between the two buildings that scary. But Mahomes is scarier. He's like the box of snakes you have to lay in. Like, I'm like, the, they're both scary, but to me, the idea of Mahomes is scarier. So I thought that they should defer. The exhaustion, I think, the, ex- the exhaustion is why. I did it. The real scary, the scariest thing was that these Niners players, Tori, are coming out and saying they weren't aware. You're, yeah, that's you're doing bad. what is why do you and these guys knew. Is this where experience comes to play? Man, I don't know if that's the experience of just kind of living under a rock. Like everyone knew about the rules, right? I think as a coach, it's important to go over those things. And we've heard that the Chiefs did that, but I mean, you know, I thought everyone understood the new overtime rules when it was a problem a few years ago. So uh, to me, as players, you have to understand that, right? You're going to get a second shot. That's why it's important for both offense and defense to play well. Right, hypothetically speaking, they went down, they got the field goal, right? They they did score mm-hmm. on their drive. But now what about the defense, right? We're putting all the blame on the offense here. That's why you have both sides that can take care of business. If the defense gets a stop, the 49ers win the Super Bowl. Right, but now we're talking about Kyle's decision. Both sides have to come up to play, right? They both have to show up to play, and that rule makes sure of that. Now, the problem is, again, like we said, you can't give Mahomes three, and ultimately Mm -hmm. three. And something that we didn't mention this entire interview Hmm. was that there was a blocked extra point. Or Mahomes and the Chiefs would have had those scoring a touchdown. And I think... At the end of regulation. Right, but I think that... Moody missing the extra point is the only reason it went to overtime. Absolutely. Otherwise, Mahomes would have gone down. And it was, him missing that it was, a, was a, the only prayer they had. Absolutely. I mean, that's a very... People are going to let that one slide over, but that one-point difference in forcing the Chiefs to score versus settling for a field goal like they had to do, they were trying to score. Yeah. The, the 49ers made the play to stop them, so it's a completely different ball game um, if they don't get that kick blocked. It's a good trending thought to have. A lot of them, I learned a lot in this conversation. Lots to chew on here. Uh, what's going on with your podcast? What's the next thing? What are your next couple of weeks or months look like, Tor? Oh, man, I know what well, the next one is coming fresh off of the Hall of Fame and the Super Bowl. We have to talk about what happened here. But I'm interested in knowing how do people make selections for the Hall of Fame? Mm. Like, that's really kind of, it's, it's, I'm, I'm questioning that a little bit. You know, I'm very happy for the guys that got in. Never be a hater. A lot of them, I, I'm thankful to call them mentors and, and OGs and me, from Julius Peppers to um, Patrick Willis to uh, Devin Hester. These are all guys that, you know, I'm thankful to compete against and also to be around. And Andre Johnson, guys that I worked out with as a youngin. Um, but I'm looking at two names that I personally know and played with, and I'm 1,000% biased towards them, is how can a guy like Anquan Bolden, Steve Smith, guys that are top 10, top 12, in both major categories, receptions and yards, mm-hmm. how do they not get in? So what does that look like? And I'm just curious. Got to do a little research, you know, and uh, figure it out. But there's so many different guys. Think about Torrey Holt, Reggie Wayne. Right. Like there's so many other receivers. It's like, man, maybe I'll just need to have a special receivers year to, to get all those goats in there. But um, the reality of it is I'm very intrigued by that after watching the Hall of Fame and, and seeing – how many years they made guys wait to get in. And another interesting nugget is Patrick Willis had to wait to get in because of the amount of time he played. Mm-hmm. Are you are you going to make Luke Keekley do the same thing, even yep. though we know he's a first ballot Hall of Famer? So talked, just interesting yeah. thoughts. We, no, we talked. Thoughts. You should have Keekley on your podcast. We talked to Keekley, and he goes, I'm just, you know, I have no control over it. And I said, well, Willis getting in, Willis quit, quit right before 30, I think. So it must mm-hmm. make you feel better that you'll be able to potentially get in. But you really never know. And I love that you brought up Steve Smith. Steve Smith mm-hmm. was top 10 in literally everything. And si- yeah. I'm just going to, I'm not going to, 
I'm not gonna say he single-handedly did it, but he carried that Panthers team to a Super Bowl. He carried them. Mm -hmm. And I think people, when you don't, it's a lot of politics. It's a lot of campaigning. Right. It's a lot of, did people in that lot, the reporters have an easy time with you? Or you, there's a lot to that. And I would mm -hmm. like that. I think there's some antiquated stuff going on. We all know it. And if I trust one person to do the investigative deep dive that needs to be done, it's Tori Smith. I think you'll, I, I cannot wait to, to track you on this journey because <laughs> there's things I've heard through my time covering the NFL where I'm like, wait, what? Make it make sense, uh, and it doesn't, so I'm looking forward to that. And, of course, Steve Smith belongs in the freaking Hall of Fame. Thanks, Tori.